This is brought to you by the Location One Building, 1734 East 63rd Street. When you invest in your community, you're really just investing in yourself. Hello, Nelson with Cascade Sports. And tonight we have uh, a gentleman that I met in 211 down at the Negro League, uh, Tabidi Lewis. How should I address you, Tabidi? Professor, doctor, or potentate? Professor is fine. No, Thabiti is fine. To How are you doing today, Carlos? It's great hey. to be back with Cascade. Hey, hey, man, it's great for uh, to have you uh, on the show. Where are you at right now? I am uh, functioning COVIDly in the uh, state of Oregon. Um, at Washington State University, Vancouver. Okay. Uh, yeah, we talked last yeah. night, and, and you were telling me about your professorship and what have you. Run that down to our audience. Oh, well, yeah, just, I was a recently promoted um, professor of English, and I'm currently the interim uh, associate vice uh, chancellor for academic affairs, which is really exciting. E excellent. As I said, uh, when I met you, you had written a book, uh, Ballers of the New School. And uh, last night we were, we were talking uh, about uh, America and the world almost is, we're living in a sports society. And you posed a question that I really hadn't, it's right in front of me, but really hadn't looked at. Now we, we've got a world without sports. So let's talk about that for a second. Well, um, if you watch ESPN, it's funny because you see nothing but retreads and people struggling to talk about nothing. Um, and, you know, I was just sort of chuckling to myself thinking, you know, wow, I should uh, wonder if I need to, if I should uh, drop my, um, cable funding for the you know espn or you know which is 24-hour sports um but but we were talking about it just because sport is such um it overwhelms our society um and you know that was something that i uh actually wrote about in my in my first book ballers of the new school race sport and american culture and uh i had the chapter called average joe and I wrote that chapter just because I was examining the fact that uh, we are uh, we are constantly constantly inundated with some some sort of sport, right? So you know, right now you would have just been wrapping up the uh, a basketball championship, and then attention would would immediately uh, pivot to focusing on the you know first week or two of the uh, baseball. Major League Baseball season. Then, you know, we move to, you know, what kids are declaring to what college. They turn that into a program. Then, you know, the, uh, the NFL draft and the uh, combine is the actual sports programming. And then, you know, NBA draft. And then, you know, summer leagues. And then now the baseball season is heating up. Then training camps for football. Then, bam. They're hitting you with uh, the, you know, the heated race in baseball alongside of um, the football season just kicking off and all these prognosticators and the excitement. And, you know, by the time we get into September, late, late September, early October, um, your everybody's attention pivots to the to the uh, World Series. And as soon as that ends, the NBA season or preseason is just jumping off. But you don't really trip off that yet because people stay locked into football and hockey, right? And then, then the basketball season starts, you, you know, and then uh, people pay a little attention to that until around, uh, what is that, January, and then now the NFL playoffs, and then the Super Bowl. And then, you know, so it's a, and it's a 20, I, I, in my book, I said it was 25-7, not 24-7. And uh, just because there's, there's no break from this entertainment and uh, distraction. Why, why, and so, is it, why is it, I'm cutting you off, why do you feel it's like that at this point in time? Yeah, be, well, 
I think it's two pronged. People want to be distracted from their problems and the realities that face them. And uh, the, uh, I mean, you know, and the entertainment companies uh, are, are, you know, playing a role in keeping people distracted. I mean, people, uh, you know, remember, you know, ESPN is run by Disney. Disney is, inter that's an entertainment, you know, it's, it's, you know, uh, entertainment sports network, <laughs> so, uh, entertainment sports programming network. I mean, entertainment. And so, um, you know, we live in an oligarchy. No one wants to, uh, no one wants to acknowledge that, but we live in an oligarchy. And this is another thing that was part of that book. I love, you know, when I look at my first book, Balls of the New School, so many things have come to fruition and conversations like the one we're having now about this sort of, uh, you know, keeping the population, the average Joe completely preoccupied with really empty, empty nothingness. I mean, you know, I love, I play football, baseball, basketball, all this stuff, but, you know, we have to be politically astute. And so, you know, I only wrote about, I only right, I'm cutting you off for a minute because there's a few things I want to, because we're going to go on, you've got a new book coming out and we want to talk about, uh, bam, this movie. Uh, first of all, how I look at it, you, you say Disney, and that's, that's a new take for me. Didn't even know ESPN was owned by Disney. Uh, I look at it as economics. I'm a businessman and it's all about money. And mm -hmm. so what I wanted to uh, say to you, because I, I fell out with my vice president about two years ago over us not talking about the NFL, not uh, uh, giving any updates on the NFL, <coughs> excuse me, with three black coaches, and I, I don't have the exact percentages, but I would say the NFL is about 75% African Americans. And uh, at least 70. Huh? Yeah, at least 70. Oh, all right. And uh, our community, uh, this big business on apparel and these teams, and, and how you describe we go into one season after another, with each one of those seasons, Billions of dollars are being made and millions of dollars are being made on apparel. And they whip the cities up into a frenzy to support these teams. And when I look at the NFL and from an African-American standpoint, uh, the, the, the owners, especially that Dallas owner, uh, if you don't stand up for the flag, if you don't mm -hmm. this and that, we're, we're firing you. And uh, I don't know how our community can be such disengaged to go along with this type of deal uh, in supporting this. And I guess <coughs> you, you, you said it succinctly. It's, uh, they have us, uh, instead of looking at what the real issues are, they have us in this, like they say, fantasy football. Uh, this. No, oh, that's right. Say, what it's do you like? You're, you're Alice in Wonderland, or you're, you know, you you're down the rabbit hole. You're, you know, get out. Your 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 consciousness is pushed down, right? Like my man, beneath the consciousness, consciousness uh, beneath uh, the reality that's that's actually happening. And uh, some people, you know. Uh, are trying to might be trying to struggle to get out of it or you know really not aware of it you know like you're 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 in the matrix and you don't know it <laughs> you know what? Hey, hey, if you will. Uh, uh, Dr. Lewis you that's been my favorite phrase for the last 10 years that anything man can think of we can do and that movie the matrix that really said it all. And that yeah. is what it's coming down to. This alternate reality that we don't, reality is so, <clears throat> so harsh that we don't, we want to escape reality. That's right. People want to escape. And, and in sport, there's no longer, uh, what, one thing that will, I guess, is uh, gaining some level of, uh, has gained a certain level of popularity, even as this sort of, uh, what is this, gaming, e-gaming or what have you, you know. Not familiar uh, with that. Themselves. 
Yeah, you know, so you're absolutely right, Carlos, and we have to be very, very, uh, very careful, you know, but in a world without sports, my hope is that people actually uh, begin to pick up books, begin to just think, you know, you're forced, you can only watch so many documentaries right. or old, I mean, they're replaying old games or, you know, this kind of mess. And so it's one of those situations where no one can come together. And so, uh, and that's and, and I get it. real quick. Yeah, well, and I think you're going to see, uh, not I think, I'm telling you, uh, you'll see articles that will report a higher level of uh, uh, mental illness issues because people are already depressed. They're already uh, dealing with socialization issues pre-COVID that the sports allows this sort of, you know, false uh, dynamic of connection to something or escape. And so the sport functions to give people this false sense of, uh, some sense of connection to the Kansas City Royals or the, you know, Tampa Bay Bucks, whatever. whatever the team is. But do you really have a connection to people? You know, people could be right next to each other cheering about the game, but never, you know, strike up a conversation. And that was, again, one of my uh, arguments in the book is that, you know, if we could approach the, the uh, you know, easing racial, uh, not easy, uh, you know, um, attacking racial relation, racial tensions in our society, if uh, through real conversation and connection, Right, and using sport as it's, the bridge. Right, I was going to say, sports should have been the bridge for the bridge. that conversation. Yeah, yeah. And what I say so, is that the art of conversation is lost in America. It is lost. I'm, and the art of reading and thinking critically is lost in America as well, uh, Carlos. And so, um, you know, you, I'm telling you, the, the, the two things of, are undeniably have to come to the surface that may cause people to organize themselves and uh, push back against the, you know, when I talk about the oligarchy, the sort of, you know, the, the huge disparities in wealth, right, that exists. Um, and, uh, and also the, the very, the, the void in human and personal social relations and, and connections. Uh, you're gonna see a lot of people breaking down mentally, as well as the financial break is already there. It's already tenuous. I mean, I'm in a university where, you know, many of our students are Pell Grant eligible. And anything, any little thing, something like COVID, right, where they can't actually go to work and uh, could put them over the edge or that they actually have to have well, internet. Uh, and and, all and you things. talking about that, uh, you know, when uh, the African-American community was just bogged down in the drug culture and, and so forth, and mm -hmm. uh, now the majority community with, uh, I forgot what the pill's names, you opioid know. Opioid epidemic. Yeah, That's an opioid yeah, epidemic. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. For us, it was just pathological. It was just, right. you know. But <laughs> I, believe that, I believe that the drug use, the alcohol use, all of that is really trying to escape reality. Yeah. And uh, they, they're, they're symptoms of a much larger uh, uh, problem. But you told well, me- the problem is, is, is outright capitalism and greed. And I'm not saying I'm against you know, free enterprise, but let's really be free and let's really not, not be so greedy that you are undermining the, uh, the the, the foundation. Existence. Yeah, the very existence. You know, the biggest joke, if you ask me, is the whole notion of there being a middle class. And no. that's just, that's just, uh, it's, a, it's a very minute number of people. And, and, and right? do you know because what if they you really ran the numbers on, hey, the numbers on what's middle class, many people might jump off a bridge, you know, to find out that they're not middle class. And it's so telling that you know, when uh, President Obama, I think a year or two before he left office, uh, had Joe Biden do a, do a study or, you know, kind of draw information to kind of, you know, categorize what the middle class is. And, and rather than them say, oh man, wow, a lot of people, here's what the average income is for a family of four or two or what have you. And um, here's what would be considered middle class. So rather than really just lay that out, they just said, you know what? Middle class is whatever you, 
Whatever you feel yeah. it is. Let me you know what what I'm I'm saying? <laughs> Before we go to uh, this other subject, I want to touch on this. Uh, first of all, uh, the 1%, and I'm going to break it down to the 10%. Mm -hmm. What they like to do to ease their conscience, oh, I gave a million to this, I put a 10 million to this or that. When you look at it uh, from a practical standpoint, the companies that they run, are the same companies that's, that's poisoning the earth, that's yeah. doing all of these things that are damaging humanity. Absolutely, and, Carlos. And, There's and, a book called Winners Take All. I, that, oh, I, I got, hold it, I, I, I got it, that's what. Okay, yeah, 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 that's it. it, that's it. My man lays it out. These cats have gotten real slick. And uh, it eases know. their, they, they, they want to act like they're magnanimous and that they're, do, they want to ease their conscience, I believe, and some might not even have a conscience to show, oh, look what a great person I am. I've given 20 million to this or to that. But your that same company is what is destroying society. And when I look at uh, the wealth gap, I'm like, how much money can you Do have you in a lifetime? That's right. Well, and there's also a certain paternalism, as uh, Winners Take All take, talks about, and it's not the first time that uh, this is not a new thing, but what's happening is you have, you know, uh, this is a historical uh, approach of these ruthless barons, industrialists, who will, you know, completely uh, exploit the working class, be against unions and fair working, you know, living wage, and then say, well, you know, I'm going to give this money back because they never would have given it. They wouldn't have known what to give it to and they wouldn't have given it. Even though studies show when people are making decent money, they invested in their families, you know? And so, uh, so it's a very paternalistic thing. It's also just, a, uh, you know, it's, it's the wealthy creating the rules of right. what uh, social justice is going to look let, like. So speaking of social justice, you know, my, uh, my project, I'm going to pivot for you. My project, uh, BAM, Chicago's Black Arts Movement, is just that. Uh, it examines the Black Arts Movement in the 1960s uh, um, in general, but through the lens of Chicago. And Chicago as this really uh, unique space uh, because of its history of uh, Black institution building and politics and having people like, uh, you know, Caden Drake, uh, Gwendolyn Brooks, Margaret Burroughs, Richard Wright, you know, um, all these individuals who understood the importance of building institutions and a lot of black entrepreneurs who supported the arts. And so, uh, and then you have a lot of black people who were politicized. And, you know, Chicago has a very rich and strong history okay. around uh, labor organizing, et cetera. And so I examined, you know, Obasi and the Ra and, uh, 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 Phil Coran and uh, AACM, their or musical organization, uh, and the Afro Arts Theater and the uh, Southside Cultural Center and the Afro Cobra and, you know, Kuomba Theater and all of these, you know, figures who really came together to use arts to, to create consciousness and build community. And so, um, and then, you know, I, uh, I did that while I was um, fi finishing up this book that I uh, that I that was really my dissertation topic uh, called um, the book is called Black People Are My Business. Run it down on that. Uh, are, huh? Run it down. Say it again. You know, I'm okay, yeah. I, my colloquialism. Uh, you know, I keep it. I keep it black, and I keep it somewhat not uh politically correct the uh the street term run it down <laughs> ah, okay all right i i wasn't i was i knew that was i just i wasn't sure if i heard you all the way uh but yeah it's called black people are my business tony k bombard's practices practices of liberation and so you know i'm a literature scholar and uh i do work around black feminism and i just examine her fiction and her role as a major of uh, black nationalist feminist voice uh, during the 1970s and 80s 
And I talk about that liberation impulse of that period and how her work really did that, but also promoted and pushed Black feminism, was critical of, uh, you know, sexism and any components of, you know, any, yeah, sexism, but, in, but definitely uh, profess a Black nationalist, uh, you know, a sensibility, as well as a Black feminist sensibility, but it was all about building community and family. Let me, let me ask you a question. Uh, uh, I'm not familiar with her, should be, but when it comes to black feminism, uh, this is my take on all of that. Black women work with the majority community, the white women on their marches, on, on their issues, but I don't see that reciprocity when it yeah. comes to addressing. Right. Uh, how, right. how, how, how do you see that? No, you're absolutely, you're right. Um, and so, you know, you, you have someone like Tony Cade who uh, published one of the most important anthologies called The Black Woman that came out in 1970. It was a, uh, one of those pocket paperbacks. And uh, it was a huge success, bestseller. And you had people like, you know, Alice Walker and, you know, just all these, uh, you know, very serious uh, Black feminists contributing to it and speaking to uh, the issues that white women weren't willing to broach regarding black women and uh, speaking to issues that black men weren't uh, willing to broach. And so, uh, and, uh, and just really uh, reflecting the full nature of what does it mean to be a black woman. And uh, so it's, it's great. I mean, it's Where a do you great... see that now? Where do you see that movement with black women as of 2020? Well, I mean, I'm in my, my, my own work, I'm really pushing Tony K. Bambara because I think that she reflects the, the, we are not at battle. We can't be in battle with each other for us to be successful as a nation, as a community to achieve liberation. But we also can't be dishonest with each other and tolerate uh, uh, patriarchy and sexism. So if I'm anti-racism, I gotta be anti-patriarchy and sexism. I just have to be. You know, and it's not about being a man means being um, being conscious and serious about the development and growth of your family, of your community. And that means whoever whoever has the skill set to do what needs to get done, they do that. You know, it's like, you know, you have to talk to guys in sports terms and say, you're not going to make your older brother the quarterback just because he's the older brother, but he can't throw the ball but 10 yards. You know, if the little brother can throw a 50-yard spiral on the dime, then he's a quarterback. So same thing in our relationships with our women. You know, whoever has the, the skill set to do whatever is necessary, that's what we do. And so it's all about us working together. I, I want to go to another, another subject real quick. What do you have to say about uh, this uh, diversity deal? Because I've had, I, I interviewed. Uh, what what you mean, diversity deal? The, what? Uh, they they put these terms about diversity. That's been to me a catchword over the last five years, and uh, how I look at diversity from being a businessman, and especially had been in construction when they first started talking about this MBE, and from my perspective, MBEs were was was brought about for African Americans to try to get a fair shake. And then they bought WNBE in. And I seen uh, the white businessmen have their nieces, their wives do companies, and then they didn't have to do business with uh, black business. Then I seen uh, they bring in uh, the, the gay and the lesbian community. And then they bring in the disabled community. And I see that, not that I'm against any of that, you follow me? But mm -hmm. I see that we, we, we're the low on economics, health, housing, and everything. And what winds up happening, it dilutes whatever it is. Yeah. That, what, what's your take on that? So, um, listen, Tony. We have to keep this in mind. Uh, Tony Bolden, 
who was a professor of African-American studies at University of Kansas, uh, once used the analogy of uh, reflecting on his, when he would go visit his father in his farm in Arkansas and watch his, his I mean, not his father, his grandfather, and watch his grandfather, he's a city boy, going to the, to the country for a month and watching his grandfather go and have this big sack of corn that he'd be holding and reach in and toss handfuls of corn to the chickens. And the chickens would all peck at each other and fight to get the kernels. And he always found it fascinating that none of the chickens went and tried to climb in the bag or jump up in the bag. Or the, so what we have to do is understand that the source of, we can't be fighting over piecemeal corn. And we have to uh, attack the, or, or really address our attention on the source of where all the corn is and the tosser that's creating the confusion. And so we must stay focused in that regard, right? And not get divided or uh, lose sight of what's really causing the fact that you're fighting over over corn, over, right. over kernels. Crumbs, really. Over, well, yeah, crumbs, kernels, as, or as they say, when I was a kid, we fighting over kibbles, you know. Kibbles and <laughs> fish. Yeah. So, you know, you know that, that's my answer, right? Let me that's say this answer. to you. So it's about it is power. so refreshing to talk to someone with honesty. Uh, I find our community, Especially, you that say there's no middle class. I, I say all these people. I say it's very small. Right, right. And if, and if you had to really take the numbers and lay them out and look at the people, people would be embarrassed and, and really angry and upset to find out that they don't fit it because people have this notion of democracy and this, this idea of, you know, uh, uh, that, you know, basically the, the contract is that everyone has a right to an opportunity. And, uh, but, but, but if you really had to examine your status, many people would be pissed off, you know, that it doesn't reflect it for it. You know, and I always say when I go in and talk about, and talk about uh, ballers or give lectures on, you know, critical race, I always say, you know, when my kids were young, we lived out here in Oregon and they would always say, we need to keep a little, uh, you know, some kind of little pack or bag for the homeless people. And so, uh, you know, so then we we're living in Oregon, and as we're going on and off the the, the uh, expressways and everywhere we're going, you're seeing these homeless people, and and, the, and they're all white. And we went to St. Louis to visit my family, and a you know brother that probably was a needed was destitute came up to me and asked me for something, and I kind of said no, I didn't have it. And my my oldest daughter, who was about four or five at the time came up and said, dad, what's wrong with him? And I said, what do you mean? He doesn't have anything. She said, no, what do you, he can't be, he can't not have anything. What do you mean? You know, uh, because- She didn't understand it. Well, she didn't understand it because in Oregon, the majority of the black people she saw were doing okay. Successful. And the people that she saw as, as being destitute, if they, if they were, were white. Right, because they're the majority of the population, and this is the majority. Now we know in these spaces a lot of black people are doing really bad, but her vision was still what people fail to see is that many, 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 many white people aren't doing well because again, this oligarchy, this disproportionate resources, and then that is compounded, right? A poor black person, poor white person, you know, now we got the discrimination. So now, you know what I'm saying? So um, so but if they could just if people could just be honest with the fact that you know, there's, there's inequity, there's an imbalance in access to resources. You know, and I always, in my classes, go into this mode trying to get my white students to really be critical and understand class as well as racial dynamics that compound it, right? That if I'm standing here before you, I've had to be really, really excellent compared to your other professors, right? But if they can understand that, then you'll come and organize with me uh, and be critical in understanding the society and the, and the hoax that would, that would force you to challenge and, uh, and topple the powers that be to really reflect the principles and ideals that the constitution promises that you know, aren't being, uh, I don't think that contract is not being met. It's not being met for whites and it's certainly not being met for people of color.
because of the, the immense greed of those that have power. And you know, Carlos, I have to run uh, in like a couple of minutes, but this, this is, uh, I haven't had a chance to talk in at least a couple of years because I've been uh, doing administrative work, you know, speak like this, doing administrative work and, um, and just kind of quietly doing my research. So, you know, this is, this is refreshing. Hey, uh, Tabidi, in uh, closing, uh, what would you say to our audience? Rewind what I just said the last five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but no, stay woke, you know, stay woke. Uh, this is a moment that's forcing you to, to, to be, stay woke, be woke, you know, and people really just open a book, you know, uh, even push away from the goddamn, god darn computer screen that is, that is tracking you and even trying to control what you, what you're reading, right? Or how much information you're gathering, but maybe pick up a book, find alternative streams of information. You well, know, see, I uh, had that book, When It Takes All. Oh, my God. I yeah, read something on PBS, and, and, and he was the author. I, I don't even read. I, I went out and bought See, something. here you there you go. I'm going to say to our audience, Carlos, read. Audience, read. 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 <laughs> right. You can't get woke unless you read. You might pick right. the wrong color pill. <laughs> Holly, you, you're right. I, I, I want to be Neo. I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. You got to pick up, the, you got to keep picking up the books, you know, yeah. and, uh, and that is absolutely it, man. And in, in closing, as we always say, when you invest in your community, you're really just investing in yourself. Good night. It was a pleasure having you on the show, Tabidi. Okay. Thank you, Carlos. We'll, right. we'll meet again. We'll meet again. The program is brought to you by the Kansas City Business Association.